stuff like mix you up. There's so many terms, but it's really easy. Like it's really basic stuff. It's just that sometimes the terms overwhelm people and they kind of tune out. But if you think about it, it all makes perfect sense. And so those should be easy questions. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's all I wanted to get through. So I'm glad at least we'll be, we'll be able to finish the lecture today. So we just have a couple um, blood pressure kind of terms to finish out the chapter in our discussion of pressure. So again, we said that arterial blood pressure maintains blood flow to the capillaries, right? It's that, that change in pressure in the arteries that keeps the blood flowing through the capillaries. In general, pressure has to overcome resistance in order to keep the blood flowing. When we look at pressure though, the pressure, specifically arterial blood pressure, the pressure in our arteries, um, you can't just say pressure in the arteries is always 100, or the pressure in the arteries is always 110, because it varies greatly depending on what cycle or what part of the cardiac cycle we're in. If you think about it, when the heart contracts, it pushes blood into the vessels at a really high pressure. When it relaxes, the elastic arteries push forward, but it's not at nearly as high of a, a pressure as the heart contracting. So the arterial blood pressure actually fluctuates up and down throughout each cardiac cycle as the ventricles contract and then relax, contract and then relax. So when we talk about arterial blood pressure, clinically we'll typically use two blood pressure terms, right? Systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. Right? Or you'll say, um, like that's when you get your blood pressure say, they'll say 120 over 80, right? 120 slash 80. 120 millimeters mercury is the systolic pressure. So the high value will be your systolic blood pressure. That's the pressure of the blood in your arteries during ventricular systole. What does systole mean? Contraction. contraction. So that makes sense, right? When your ventricles contract forcefully, they cram a bunch of blood into the vessels, that blood is really highly pressurized. The second number is the diastolic pressure. So that's the minimum pressure. That's when the ventricles are in diastole, which is what? when they're relaxed. Okay, so again, when they relax, there's still pressure because there's still blood in the vessels. And remember, we said the elastic arteries will kind of snap shut, so that generates a little bit of extra force, a little bit of extra pressure, um, but that's gonna be a lot less than the systolic pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between the two. So the difference between the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. Um, <clears throat> that essentially is telling you how much force the heart's contraction is generating. Right? If there's a bigger difference between the systolic and diastolic, then the heart generated even more pressure or even more force. Because the diastolic is when the heart's not contracting. Right? So if you compare that to when the heart is contracting, you see, okay, the heart generated 40 milliliters mercury. The heart generated 30 millimeters of mercury. The heart generated 45 millimeters of mercury. They kind of, it, it roughly correlates with how hard the heart is actually contracting. Um, now, clinically, we typically use both numbers, um, the systolic and diastolic, right? Every time you've gone to the doctor's office, they probably tell you your blood pressure is whatever, 123 over 81, um, or 115 over 70, whatever. But we can come up with a mean arterial pressure. So on those graphs that we were just looking at when we said the average pressure in the arteries was 100, that's what we were talking about, the mean arterial pressure. We didn't use two values, right? We just used one. So you can average the blood pressures in order to get just one value to use. I guess theoretically it's easier to just say one value than it is to say two, but the two values give you a lot more information about the patient. Um, and it's easier because you don't have to calculate a mean arterial pressure. Um, but you guys should know that it exists. So the mean arterial pressure, the way that we find it is we use the diastolic pressure, which is the low one, plus the pulse, plus one third, sorry, of the pulse pressure. Remember the pulse pressure is the difference between the systolic and diastolic. So if I said that the person's <coughs> blood pressure was 120 over 90, and you guys should be able to do this on the test. Um, if I said that the pressure was 120 over 90, and I wanted you to calculate their mean arterial pressure, 
Okay, diastolic, which one's the diastolic? 90, right, plus a third of the pulse. How do I get the pulse pressure? The difference, right, so what's the difference? 30 divided by three, right, a third. So that's 10, so my mean arterial pressure <clears throat> it would be about 100 millimeters of mercury. Cool, I need to update this. There's some brand new blood pressure guidelines that just came up and made a big stink. So my values are a little off depending on what source you use. So the normal arterial blood pressure we just said is 120 over 80. <clears throat> so, um, hypertension, hyper means what? Above, right, or too high, too much. Hypertension is too much tension, too much pressure in those vessels. So that's high blood pressure, an abnormally high blood pressure. Um, again, they just updated a bunch of blood pressure guidelines and it kind of depends on if you're looking at a normal person, someone with diabetes, someone with renal failure, uh, if you're looking at guidelines from six months ago versus guidelines now. In general, we used to always say that hypertension was defined as anything over 140 over 90. Um, and then we only went for lower, uh, before that was pre-hypertension. And then we only went for lower goals, like 130 over 80 or 130 over 90 if they had like comorbid diseases like diabetes or something. Um, but I'm not gonna ask you this number because again, it's kind of a mm, number right now. Um, the problem with hypertension is that it increases the workload on the heart, right? Remember that um, the heart has to generate enough pressure to overcome all of this resistance. So if the heart is generating more pressure, it's because it has to, okay? It's not doing it for fun. Right, it's, it's generating that much pressure because there's obviously more resistance somewhere and it's got to overcome it. So it's working harder. Your heart's a muscle, right? So if you're working it really, really hard all the time, you can actually cause the heart muscle to, to start to grow and enlarge. And that's not a good thing. Um, that decreases the efficiency of the heart and it can start to damage the myocardium. Okay, so we don't want that to happen. We don't want it to increase the workload on the heart too much. Hypotension, hypo, remember, means below. So hypotension is an abnormally low blood pressure. Again, I hate to give a number for this. Um, a lot of things will cite less than 90 over 60, so either value. If your systolic's less than 90, if the diastolic's less than 60. But again, just like we said with pulse, this can vary greatly depending on the person. So you could have a really, really um, well-trained like triathlete who has a naturally very low blood pressure. Um, because of the efficiency of their cardiovascular system. So again, it, it just varies, varies greatly. Um, natural hypotension is rare. Most times clinically when you see someone with hypotension, it's because we've done it. We've caused hypotension with medications. Um, like we give them too much of a high blood pressure medicine and then that causes the hypotension. Um, or else it's because of volume depletion. So like when someone bleeds out um, or is dehydrated or they don't have enough volume, that can decrease their pressure but just normal cardiovascular, cardiovascularly generated hypotension is really rare. FYI. Okay guys, yay, we made it with 10 minutes to spare today. That's like a